Coming up, beat the heat. My question is, what is a heat wave? With temperatures sizzling in parts of the country, what you need to know to stay cool and be safe. Also ahead, brain freeze. We'll explain the science behind an ice cream headache. Then meet Beacon and Bowie, the country's very first canine lifeguards. Go! Plus, Helping Hand will introduce you to these kids who are mowing lawns to help the elderly and those in need. I look forward to doing this over and over again because I love mowing lawns and I love helping the community. And Thrill Ride. <laughs> Come along as we scream our way to the history of one popular ride, the roller coaster. I like the feeling about how you like when you go, like how you go down like that like steep drop and then like your stomach drops. I feel like that's like everyone's favorite feeling about it. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back, everyone, to Nightly News Kids Edition. It is always great to be with you. I'm out here on the West Coast, coming to you from Universal Studios Hollywood, which is owned by our parent company, NBC Universal. Always nice to be here. We've got a really fun lineup in store for you all, including some high tech fireworks that lit up the sky in a brand new way last week. But first, let's begin with the summer weather. Parts of the country have been experiencing some sizzling temperatures recently, and it got us thinking just what exactly is a heat wave and how can you keep cool? Our good friend Dylan Dreyer explains. The heat is on. My question is, what is a heat wave? My name is Charlie, and my question is, what is a heat wave? That's a good question. A heat wave is a period of unusually hot weather that typically lasts three or more days. The temperatures have to be above average for the area that you live in. For example, a few days of 95 degree weather in a place like Vermont is considered a heat wave, but wouldn't be one in Arizona. Why? Well, that's because Arizona usually experiences those high temperatures. Did you know heat waves are generally the result of trapped air? As opposed to cycling around the globe, it simply stays put and warms like the air inside an oven. Why does it feel sticky on hot summer days? Well, that's humidity. Humidity is the amount of water vapor in the air. If there's a ton of water vapor in the air, then the humidity will be high. So when it's really humid outside, it can make you feel wet and sticky. Desert areas usually have low humidity. Tropical regions usually have higher humidity. Hot and humid weather can also lead to storms. The more heat and humidity, the wetter and stronger the storm. So when the summer heats up, what can you do to cool off and stay safe? First, remember to stay hydrated and drink lots of fluids. We want you drinking before you even feel thirsty. So that means as soon as you get up in the morning and you know you're going to be spending a lot of time outside, just start drinking water. You can spray it. You can also play in it. Think playing in a pool or running through a sprinkler. You can also eat water. Yep, you heard me. You can eat water in the form of salads and fruit and popsicles. Also, wear cool clothing and light colors. Think light and loose. And limit your activity outside if it's really hot. If it's more than 90 degrees outside, kind of don't recommend spending more than 30 minutes at a time outside. And when you are outside, make sure to try to try to stay in the shade if you can and try to stay inside between the hours of 11 and 2. That's when the sun is strongest. And when it comes to heat exhaustion and heat stroke, doctors say to look for these signs. Some of the earliest signs of heat exhaustion, um, you know, would be feeling kind of tired. Um, maybe you might feel a little bit achy, like your muscles could feel a little bit sore. Um, your skin might start to feel kind of like, kind of damp and cool. Once your skin starts to feel really dry and hot, that's when we get really concerned about something called a heat stroke, which can be much, much more serious. So remember, you can beat the heat by following the doctor's orders and don't forget your sunscreen.
All right, Dylan, thanks very much. Well, if you're like me, one of my favorite treats to eat during the summer is ice cream. But sometimes eating it can cause a headache or what they call brain freeze. We asked our good pal, Dr. John Torres, to explain why that happens. We all love ice cream, but some of us experience a short, really painful headache Ow. when we eat it too fast. All of us fancy doctors have a complicated name for this, sphenopalatine ganglioneuralgia, and some others call it a cold stimulus headache. But it's just another name for brain freeze or ice cream headache. And it's your body's way of reacting to something really cold. Here is what scientists believe is happening. When we eat ice cream or something cold, it hits the roof of our mouth called the upper palate. The cold then triggers the nerve that lets you feel sensations in the front of your head called the trigeminal nerve. That nerve then sends a signal to your brain that says, hey, this is way too cold. So to warm the area, our bodies pump extra blood to the roof of your mouth. And during this process, our blood vessels expand even in the brain. That quick change in blood vessel size causes sudden pain lasting for about 20 to 30 seconds. But brain freeze is still a scientific mystery because not everyone gets them. As a matter of fact, only about half of us get these types of headaches. But if you do get an ice cream headache, here are some tips you can use to ease that painful throbbing. First, remove the cold food. Then take your thumb and push it onto the roof of your mouth, kind of like this. You're trying to warm that area up as quickly as possible. You can also try drinking warm water. But remember, this pain will go away pretty quickly on its own. So the best thing to do is slow down when eating cold food and avoiding the dreaded ice cream headache altogether. Because I won't let a little brain freeze stop me from enjoying my favorite flavor, some classic vanilla. And it shouldn't stop you either. Dr. John Torres, thanks very much. Well, let's head to one beach in Maine where two four-legged additions to the lifeguard staff are making a big splash. Let's get details now from our good friend, Kristen Dahlgren. When it's hot, they call it the dog days of summer. So this beach in Maine is taking that quite literally. Go. Meet Beacon and Bowie, the first and only lifeguard dogs in the U.S. People love seeing the dogs here. They do patrol the beach with a lifeguard so that people do interact with them. They are part of the staff. Veteran lifeguard Greg Wilford says he got the idea of using water rescue dogs from Italy and worked with the American Academy of Canine Water Rescue to put these pups on patrol here at Scarborough Beach State Park. I have these guys being trained as second responders now. So their job will be to follow the first responder into the water and pull in who is ever out there in the water back with their lifeguard. So they'll have a lifeguard with them at all times. What's the benefit of having a dog do that? She can pull in three to five people at a time. Wow. It's another tool that we add to the uh, beach and uh, we found it to be pretty successful. The breed, called Newfoundlands, are known to be strong swimmers. Good job, Beacon. What makes these dogs so great at this? A lot of water rescue dogs aren't Newfies. They're Labs, they're Goldens, they're, they can be any type of uh, um, dog if, they can, if they're good swimmers. Mm -hmm. But the Newfies, their paws are big and they don't swim the dog paddle, they swim a modified breaststroke. Oh, so their really? arms go out to the side and they use that to pull themselves in. They've been known through history to be able to go in and save people. Let's go, Beacon. Beacon and Bowie have undergone both land and water training and continue to take part in daily life-saving drills, including on the back of a jet ski. They need to recognize what their job is. So when they see that the person is in the water, they will both accelerate off the jet ski and go to the person, and the same when they're making a swim and rescue. Go! It's heavy work for them to go through those waves. It is. You know, I look at it that this is the first place that they've been lifeguards on a public beach. They're written into the rescue procedures, mm -hmm. and I do see it down the road where these dogs are 
all over beaches in the United States with a first responder or a second responder. They need the help. Their reward when they get out of the water is play. This is it. They want to get this tug and have a little fun. Go get it, bud. Beacon and Bowie have yet to make a real rescue, but Greg is confident they have all the skills to help save lives. And the reaction here has been incredible. It's been really positive, especially from a water safety. They're really cute. I think it's cool watching them jump into the water. It really just enhances like the environment around here. Just makes everyone happy. Do you think people on this beach are safer thanks to these guys? Yeah, I think especially that public aspect of just being able to educate people, especially kids. Now we're able to educate kids and parents. Good job. Summer vacation with a side of learning and some super cute lifesavers. All right, Kristen, thanks for bringing that story to us. Let's head to Los Angeles, where I am right now, where last week some parts of the city celebrated the 4th of July by lighting up the sky without fireworks. You're looking at 500 drones all working together to make giant moving pictures in the sky from animated athletes to explosions that look a lot like what you typically see on the 4th of July. Some cities are moving away from traditional fireworks, especially in dry, hot places, because of concerns about fire danger or pollution. But they're not missing much. These drones are really pretty effective and pretty cool. Let's turn now to inspiring kids and some young people across the country who are lending a helping hand to those who might be struggling by doing one simple chore, mowing a lawn. For some kids, a weekly chore has turned into a challenge, a 50-yard challenge to be exact. This is my first time, like, helping people out. And it made me like, it made me feel happier. Started in 2016 by Rodney Smith Jr., Raising Men and Women Lawn Care challenges kids to mow 50 lawns for free in their community to help the elderly, disabled, single parents, and veterans. Most of the people that we mow for, they can't afford it. So when we can come mow the lawn for free, that now frees them up. Now they can use the funds for food, medication, and other things they really need. For brothers Lamar and Requavis Knight, this challenge became a part of their everyday life. Everything that goes around comes around. So if you're doing something good to put into the world, then it's like it's going to come around one day and be like, hey, this is your blessing to you. The brothers were first introduced to the program when they were on the receiving end of the service as young kids and then decided to pay it forward. They completed their 50-yard challenge their first summer volunteering, but the work became a passion lasting years. I have a passion to help people and giving back to like people though, like those that actually need it. We caught up with 12-year-old Christopher Moore on his first day of taking part in the challenge, helping out Frances Helton with her lawn. People like myself, it's it really, I mean, I couldn't do it myself. They really helped me quite a bit. And I just appreciate their generosity. I look forward to doing this over and over again because I love mowing lines and I love helping the community. With more than 4,000 kids participating in the U.S. and around the world, Rodney gifts each kid who completes their 50-yard challenge with a brand new mower, weed whacker, and blower thanks in part to donations. It's not just moving lawns, you're actually building relationships and getting to know each and every one of these people. Building relationships and helping teach kids about the importance of giving back. It's just good to see a smile on people's faces and know that you're helping out the community. You did a wonderful job. I mean, it's just, just absolutely great. Finally, at amusement theme parks across the country and around the world, there is one popular attraction that promises lots of thrills. We're talking about the roller coaster. But did you ever wonder how this ride started rolling into history? Our pal Gotti Schwartz takes a look. Have you ever
ever taken a ride on a roller coaster? I like the feeling about how you like when like how you go down like that like steep drop and then like your stomach drops. I feel like that's like everyone's favorite feeling about it. I usually go on like the medium sized ones, nothing too big. Uh, I like the scary ones the most. I always think it's really scary, but then uh, it's okay at the end. Nowadays, these thrill rides are usually really popular during summer months. But did you know the earliest roller coasters were actually freezing cold? The first roller coasters weren't actually roller coasters at all. They didn't roll, and they, I mean, they only kind of coasted. They were actually Russian ice slides in the 17th century. In 17th century Russia, people built giant slides out of ice, then sent riders down on sleds. And in the early 1800s, the French brought that icy concept over to France, adding rolling wheels to account for the warmer climate, which is where the term roller coaster came from. In the 1870s, the Mock Chunk Switchback Railway was created out of an old mining rail car in Pennsylvania, and for just five cents, passengers could coast down the tracks at a whopping six miles an hour. Then, in 1884, the first modern roller coaster was designed by Lamarcus A. Thompson, it was called the Switchback Railway and debuted at Coney Island in Brooklyn, New York. The original Switchback Railway closed down in the 1930s, but Luna Park and Dino's Wonder Wheel at Coney Island still operate today with rides for kids of all ages. The kiddie coaster was small, it was like a dragon, it only took like around 11 seconds for it to be completed, but I found it exhilarating. Also, one thing to make sure is that if, you're, if you have a hat, hold on to it. We went in like the little kids section over there. Yes, I, I ran on the, the dragon one. He screamed like a ton, like ah! And today, roller coasters go faster than ever before, and some even go upside down, like the Steel Vengeance at Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio. Did you know the fastest roller coaster in the world is called Formula Rosa, which goes a whopping 149 miles an hour at the Ferrari World Abu Dhabi. The tallest roller coaster is King Da Ka at Six Flags Great Adventure in New Jersey, which climbs to 456 feet in the air. That's as tall as the Great Pyramid of Giza. And the oldest roller coaster still running today is called Leap the Dips at Lake Mont Park in Pennsylvania, which first opened in 1902, making it over 120 years old. And nowadays, there are all kinds of safety precautions in place, including height requirements, so this means you might need to wait until you're tall enough to ride some of the biggest coasters at your favorite park. These are designed to be as safe as possible, so as many people as possible can enjoy them safely. Height restrictions, while they're not the most fun for uh, kids under a certain height or adults, shorter adults under a certain height, um, they're all designed with your safety in mind. I went like on this really high roller coaster. It was really scary because it went like almost straight down, and my me and my me and my friends were like that were hunched over because it went so fast. I feel like really really proud. I feel like I could do it again, like a thousand more times. But if you find yourself on a roller coaster this summer, be sure to buckle up, enjoy the ride. Remember where it all started. Scotty, thanks for the fun ride. Well, that's going to do it for us from Universal Studios Hollywood. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com, and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. And just a program note, you can catch Nightly News Kids Edition this Saturday on NBC. Check your local listings for the time in your area. Thanks for watching, everyone. Remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long from Hollywood.